Hello. Uh, today we're going to ask the question, who wrote the book of James? I always thought, always thought, the book of James was written by the Apostle James, the main Apostle James, the son of Zebedee. The three main Apostles were Peter, James, and John. We read in um, Mark chapter 5 where the ruler of the synagogue has a daughter and he's about to ask Jesus to heal her and it turns out she's already dead. Uh, Jesus comes to uh, raise her from the dead and the only one he allows to come with him is Peter, James, and John. When he goes to the Mount of Transfiguration later on in um, Mark 9, he allows only Peter, James, and John. When he goes into uh, the garden to pray right before he's uh, you know, about to be crucified, he's got his heavy prayer burden, and he asks Peter, James, and John. Now, in um, Galatians 2, verse 9, Paul is writing, and he describes James, Kephas, and John. Kephas is the uh, Hebrew way of saying Petros, the Greek way of saying Peter, okay, which is a stone. Remember, his name was, went from Simon Bar-Jonah to Petros, Peter, or Ke Kephas, stone, okay? So anyway, Peter, James, and John, again, were, as it says, pillars of the church. They were to minister to the circumcision, and Paul and Barnabas were to be were to minister to the uncircumcised and he calls it heathen in Galatians King James. And by the way, Paul goes to Jerusalem to meet Peter, James, and John fourteen years after the first time. And the first time he goes to Jerusalem three years after his conversion. So, it's 17 years from the time of Paul's conversion to the time he sees Peter, James, and John in Jerusalem for the, for the second time. The first time when he went to Jerusalem, he only sees Peter and James, and he calls him the Lord's brother, and that's in Galatians 1. We'll get back to that, James, the Lord's brother. But the, what I'm getting at is these were the pillars of the church. So uh, who wrote the uh, letters to the, to the believers? Why wouldn't you expect the three pillars, Peter, James, and John, to write the letters? And don't tell me because he, he had already died. So where did I get this from? I don't know. And it may have been that when he went to Jerusalem, he writes it as only apostle I saw was James, the Lord's brother. Now for those that look at this and say, hey look, the, uh, James, his earthly brother, was already installed as an apostle three years after Paul's conversion, you have to take a look at... Um, Acts 11 where it gives the time frame when Claudius was emperor so that puts the death of James the Apostle anywhere from 11 to 24 years after the ascension of Jesus so but any anyway, like I'm saying I, I, I mean I always thought it was James son of Zebedee and guess what? I'm in a Bible study and they say, who wrote the book of James was a the question. And the guy answers, James, the natural brother of Jesus.
Well, where does he where did he get that? And and their their arguments for that answer, James of Zebedee died. He died early. He didn't have time to write the book the write the book of James, which is his small little letter. So you mean to tell me, wait a minute, hold on. It's a small little letter. He could have did it in two days, one day. He probably did do it in one day. So what do you mean? He, so he didn't have time. You could take that one and throw it into the garbage. Okay? So what's, what's the next argument they come up with? Well, James wasn't at the Council of Jerusalem where they decided on the law that's going to be given to the Gentiles. And I, I, I agree with that. I think, I think James was already uh, killed at that time. And that's because Acts 12 records the death of James, and Acts 15 records the, uh, what happened at the Council of Jerusalem. But Acts 15 does say that James comes out and makes a statement and clears the whole thing up. So James is the one that clears the whole thing up there. Now, why? What, what about the other James? The other apostle James for that person that's taken over in that in that council there. In in Acts 12, Peter is imprisoned, and right before he's imprisoned, they killed James. All right. Herod killed James right before Peter was in prison. When he gets out of prison, he says, go tell James. Now, James is already dead. So who's the James he's talking about, which is the James of the Council of, of uh, Jerusalem there? Well, why isn't it James the Apostle? There's another James, James of Alphaeus. You don't have to distinguish James of Alphaeus with James of Zebedee anymore because... James the of Zebedee is dead. There's only one more James left. So go tell James means go tell James Apostle James. Now, these guys in, interject James the brother of Jesus. Now wait a minute, hold on. Where do you get that from? You don't get it. It's not in the there's no there's no verse that says that. Where are you getting that James, the brother of Jesus, took over when James the of Zebedee uh, was martyred? Where, where, do you, where do you get that? You don't. I, it's more, you mean to tell me that the Holy Spirit is going to give this major office in this hierarchy of, of importance ministry. He's going to give the top spot to the brother James, and he's going to skip over all the rest of the apostles, including the other James? I don't think so. I don't think so. He's going to give that to another apostle. And another apostle took over, and it happened to be James. And as a matter of fact, they, when, as far as talking about James, he's not mentioned, the only, he's only mentioned one. He's only mentioned in one reference in that he was a brother. And he's mentioned with uh, the other brothers, Joseph, Simon, and Judas. Whenever he's mentioned, the other brothers are mentioned first. But he's mentioned as the first brother. In other words, he was probably the, the, the next male child uh, through Mary. And Joseph and Mary. Joseph and Mary had a natural, had natural children. It wasn't, they weren't supernatural. Like Anyway, uh... So he was probably the oldest, right? So, um, and what does J Jesus respond to that with? It's Matthew thirteen fifty seven, And they were offended in him. But Jesus said unto them, A prophet is not without honor, save in his own country and his own house. And he did not many mighty works there because of their unbelief. So what makes what would make his brother James prominent would be his faith 
in his brother whose father is God. And obviously, he doesn't get that acclamation there. As a matter of fact, he gets the opposite. The, so the only mention of his physical brother in the flesh is a negative as far as his faith goes. Who, another question that arises. Who is the disciple whom Jesus loves? Now, I used to think that the apostle that Jesus loves was John himself. And he felt a little funny saying it like Jesus loves me more than any of the others. I mean, it would be hard to say it was me. It's like almost both. What is generally accepted is he uses the third person. Instead of saying himself, he says the disciple whom Jesus loves. But you know what? He would feel the same way if that disciple was his brother, James. And I think it was James's brother because two other places where John mentions the disciple whom he, Jesus loved. One is when Jesus was on the cross, they said, look, there's your mother. Uh, now, I think that Joseph, his stepfather, had passed away, and he was taking care of his mother this whole time, you know, as in the role of honoring your mother and father. And he was felt a little responsible as to who he was going to and uh, entrust the care of his mother with. Okay, the scene is Jesus is on the cross and his mother is there and the disciple whom Jesus loves is there. Let's go to that verse. There's only one verse that describes that. John 19, 25 through 27. Now there stood by the cross of Jesus his mother Dot, dot, dot. When, when Jesus therefore saw his mother and the disciple standing by whom he loved, he says to his mother, Woman, behold thy son. Then he says to, his, to the disciple, Behold thy mother. And from that hour that disciple took her unto his own. Home is in italics. He took her unto his home officially. So, <clears throat> if you're strict about this verse, and you should be because Jesus said it, and he said it uh, very meaningfully, and he said it with, like everything else he says, what he says comes to pass. His mother is now the mother of the disciple whom he loves, which I'm saying is James. And it's from that hour. So from here on in, in scripture, we should see Mary, the mother of James. And we do. We, that's exactly what we see. There's three verses in Matthew and Mark, two in Matthew, one in Mark, that name women after he dies. So Matthew 27, 55, and 56. And many women were beholding afar off, which followed Jesus from Galilee, ministering unto him. Among which was Mary Magdalene, Mary, the mother of James and Joses, and the mother of Zebedee's children. So, remember his brothers of his flesh that were mentioned Joseph was mentioned. James was mentioned, yes. James was mentioned. So that's sort of like you can choose which James that is. His brother in the flesh or James of Zebedee. Then and she has two sons called James. But who's the one who is her, who's her first son that's going to be taken care of? Her? James the Apostle. James of Zebedee. And that's interesting because the other mother that was there was, and this is the only time she's mentioned, <clears throat> was the mother of Zebedee's children. 
So John, James and John were Zebedee's children. So why doesn't he say the mother of James and John? Because he can't really say it like that anymore. Because she's not the mother of James anymore. Officially, she's not the mother of James anymore. His mother is now named Mary, and it used to be Jesus' mother. See? That's the reason why it's sort of like weird why he said that. The mother of Zebedee's children. Now again, you could say, what if John was the disciple whom he loved? Then you would have had to say, Mary, the mother of John and Joseph. Because he was inserted into the family. See? So that's, well, that's another reason why I don't think it's John. It's James. Now Mark has an interesting way of mentioning who this other Mary is. Okay? Matt, Mark 15, 40. Now this is, again, this, this is where they're looking afar off. This matches Matthew's uh, 27, 55, and 56. There were also women looking on afar off, among whom was Mary Magdalene and Mary, the mother of James the Less, and of Joseph and Salmon. Very similar to Matthew 27, he calls him, he calls this Mary mother of James, and he throws in James the Less and Joseph, but he also mentions Salmon which I think is a female name, and I think it's one of his earthly sisters. So this is Mary, mother of James the Less, the Apostle, and I'll get to that later. Now we go to uh, the first day of the week. The Sabbath is passed. The women can now work, and in their work, they want to adorn the grave of Jesus. Matthew 28, 1. And in the end of the Sabbath, as it began to dawn, toward the first day of the week, came Mary Magdalene and the other Mary to see the supper. Now again, he already referenced this Mary as Mary of James. Mark 16. And when the Sabbath was passed, Mary Magdalene and Mary of James, the mother is in italics, so I'll just say Mary of James and Salome. He leaves out Joseph's here, but he just mentioned them over there. And they brought, uh, uh, had brought sweet spices that they might come and anoint him. Now Luke 24, 10. Um, this, it was Mary Magdalene and Joan Joanna. Now Joanna was, if you look at Luke 8, 2, and 3, she was healed of evil spirits and infirmities similarly to Mary Magdalene. So she was there too. And Mary of James, again, mothers in italics, and other women, and other, and it's italics, women that were with them, which told these things about the empty tomb unto the, unto the apostles. They were, they saw that the tomb was empty and they had to go tell, the angel told them to go tell. So you see, <clears throat> Mary of James is there again. And now, uh, John mentions this the first day of the week, John 20, verse 1. The first day of the week comes Mary Magdalene. See, she's the only woman mentioned. He only mentions Mary Magdalene because, and, but he gives a little more detail. And, it's, and, and uh, I'm thankful that he did because it is a very precious moment when Mary Magdalene sees our Savior alive. Okay, now, there is one time after the, after the death of Jesus, after his death, and it's after his resurrection, and it's after his ascension, before Pentecost, that Mary, the mother of Jesus, is there, is, is mentioned. This is the last time. But it is mentioned. She's mentioned as Mary, the mother of Jesus. Let's go there. Acts 1, 13 and 14. And when they were come in, they went up 
into the upper room, where abode both Peter and James and John and Andrew, blah, blah, blah. These all continued with one accord in prayer and supplication. Now, who else was there? With the women and Mary, the mother of Jesus, with his brethren. Okay, that's another thing to consider that with his brethren part. The only um, woman that's mentioned as a name, with a name here is Mary, the mother of Jesus. Now, I'm glad that was mentioned because that ensures us that she was a woman of God when he said, my mother and my brothers and my sisters, my family, are those that hear the word of God and act upon it and do it, do the will of God. And so the fact that she is specifically mentioned there as Mother of Jesus assures the world that she is considered to be a person of strong faith. Now, I think it's very interesting that we all have to make a choice here. Now, one of our choices could be that Mary, the mother of Jesus, was mentioned by John uh, at the scene of the cross before when he was still alive. And she was mentioned by uh, Luke in Acts when she was waiting in the upper room for the day of Pentecost. Now, those were the only two times she was mentioned. Or, you can think and say, she was mentioned because she was the mother of James. She was, when the women were adorning the grave, she was there as well. And you would expect her to be in mourning and um, at the grave and doing the typical type of things mothers do when one of their sons dies. She was there all the times and she was mentioned as Mary, the mother of James. Now, if you say that, which is what I say as well, you have to make a dis decision. Was she mentioned the mother of James? the apostle whom she loved, or was she mentioned as the mother of James because her second-born son, after Jesus, was named James. And now the uh, writers of the Gospels are not saying she's Mary the mother of Jesus anymore. Now they're saying that she's Mary the mother of James, her second-born son. And if you take that stance, you have to ignore the fact that Jesus said, Mother, behold your son. But if you take the other stance where when, she, when Jesus said, Mother, behold your son, and they're calling her Mary, the mother of James, then you have to kind of like agree with me that Mary was the mother of James, the disciple whom, she, whom Jesus loved, whose name was James, James of Zebedee. And then the other part there that you've got to wrestle with a little bit, at least I do, is with his brothers, brethren. So, according to the way he thinks, my brothers are those that hear the word of God and act upon him and do it and do the will of God. The, if, if James, his older brother, was uh, doing that, he would have been there. But it doesn't really matter to me because if, if he told his mother, woman, behold thy son, it doesn't matter if James was in the will of God or not and Jesus did consider him his brother. That doesn't matter. He still, if that was James the Apostle, she would have been called Mary the mother of James. And if it was Bartholomew, she would have been called Mary the mother of Bartholomew. All right? Now. If James, his stepbrother in the flesh, was prominent in the faith enough to, to override the apostleships and give him the job of, the, of, of uh, the council of Jerusalem, which is what they say, if 
if that was the case, then it would have been, he wouldn't even have to do any of that. That would have been natural. That, he wouldn't have to say anything because the next older brother would take care of it. But he didn't, it's almost like he didn't want to entrust the care of his mother with that, James. And, and he talk, Jesus talks about, I have not come to bring peace but a sword, dividing father against son, mother against daughter, and guess what? Brother against brother. I think the, that he was actually an enemy. I think they, they were rivals. Otherwise, why would he entrust his month, the care of his mother with, with uh, James the Apostle when James the Apostle had a lot of things to do because he was an apostle. And he also had to take care of his mother. So now, now we can better explain why uh, Paul in Galatians 1, when he talks about his first time going to Jerusalem to meet the apostles and all he sees are Peter and James and he calls him James the brother of the Lord and he gets this I believe because he put the disciple whom he loved in charge of his mother and therefore he was basically inserted right into the family so and, and was in that sense he was James the brother of the Lord okay even more strongly than James the natural brother of the Lord because he was number one he was brother in the spirit and he was and he was inserted into the family as a as as his own brother it happens to be they both had the name James and so does James of our faith. And it was confusing. It's confusing, but that's what makes mysteries mysteries. And one time, very interesting, mother of James the Less. So uh, all of a sudden, you, you, pull, you, you got a new term here. Who's mother of James the Less? It's the only time this is used. But it was understood. Otherwise, he would have explained it a little more. Now, uh, where do you get that term? James the Less. And this is going to go back to now when the mother of the Zebedee children, James and John, goes to Jesus and says, Who's going to sit on your right and your left hand? How about my two sons? So she's a little bold. She believes, you know, you know, it's okay. Jesus accepts it and understands what they're talking about. Answers it with, um, in the world of the nations, the greatest is the more powerful, and all of the and the lesser people serve the greater. In general, it's served by the lesser um, ranked military personnel okay that's how it works in the norm in the normal way of seeing things but in the kingdom of God it's not that way the greater is the guy who is serving the rest of them so in order for you to be great in the kingdom of God he's telling them right there and then you got to be a servant Okay? You got to be a servant. And so I believe that James took that seriously. He wanted to sit in the kingdom of God right next to Jesus in that spot. And he humbled himself and became a servant the way Jesus did that for us. He imitated Jesus in that way. And so I think that's how he got his title, James the Less. Which really is saying James the Great. But you don't say it that way here. You say it that we'll say it that way to you in the next world. When the millennium comes. And he's probably going to be seated at his right hand side or his left hand side. I don't know. Maybe John as well. I don't know. Maybe Peter as well. I don't know. We'll know though. We will know. That's that's not the point. 
The point is, he took it seriously and he became known as James the Less. Okay? Now, another point is, he's the disciple whom he loves. Now, why does he love, why does he love James so much? But don't forget, Jesus can see the future. He says he's a prophet. He knows the future. He's a prophet. He knows that James of Zebedee is going to be killed with the sword by Herod 20 years or so after he's ascended. He knows that. He feels for him. Okay? When John writes... Uh, the disciple whom he loves testifies of these things and records these things. Okay, that word testify is martyr. It, it, it's the Greek in the Greek. It's martyr. Now, the word testify has sort of like lost its lost a lot of its zeal. In the, in the world of being martyred, in the world of dying for a cause. Uh, whereas now, we testify and we just speak the truth about something, and that's accepted as the word, as what a testifying, a moment of testimony. That is accepted as a moment of testimony, that you, you speak the truth about something and you don't care about the consequences of what's going to happen by speaking the truth. But the idea that he's martyred, that the word is actually martyred, to me, that's, it was him again. Now, this is a topic that needs to be uh, a little more clarified, so I'd like to um, uh, start at Matthew 10, 28. Jesus is talking, and I, almost out of the blue, well, not out of the blue, but almost, and fear not them which kill the body, but are not able to kill the soul, but rather fear him which is able to destroy both soul and body in hell. So, in other words, if he was talking to James, if he's talking to the disciple whom he loves that's going to get martyred by Herod, now Herod is able to kill his body, but he's not able to kill his soul. Okay? He's talking to him. And now he's talking about two facts, two sparrows. First, the next verse. It's almost, how is that connected? It's connected, if you look at the question he says, are not two sparrows sold for a farthing? Uh, in other words, this was the price of two sparrows. Uh, that were about to be sacrificed. And he says, And one of them shall not fall on the ground without your father. So, the sparrow is on the altar, the sparrow dies, the father is right there with him. The father, the father feels that sparrow. The whole idea about sacrifice is that there's a hurt involved to pay for sin. Sin, there's a hurt for it. And he he demonstrates that hurt in animal sacrifice, and he also demonstrated with his own sacrifice. Um, verse 30, But the very hairs of your head are all numbered. Okay. So, in other words, you're very, very important to him. He knows the number of hairs on your head. Fear ye not, therefore, for you are of more value than many sparrows. And he continues with this. Whosoever therefore shall confess me before men, him will I confess also before my Father which is in heaven. So there's the testimony again. In other words, be bold in your testimony before men because they can't hurt you, but he, but he has the ability to, to, to not save you. And he loves you. He wants to save you. He wants you to be bold. He wants you... And then to, he wants you to confess him before men. And he'll confess you as, in other words, he's your lawyer. The Father in heaven is the judge. 
him as a lawyer will confess and, and, and mediate your case before the Father because you confess Yeshua as your Savior to those men that are like Caiaphas and, uh, and uh, uh, Pilate and, and uh, Herod and, and those guys that condemned an innocent man. They'll condemn you too. He told us that. And now back to um, the war within the house, the war of faith that within the own, your own household. Back to that, we might as well keep going here. Matthew ten thirty four. Think not that I am come to send peace on earth. I came not to send peace, but a sword. For I have come to set a man at variance against his father. And the daughter against his, her mother, and the daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. And then 36. A man's foes shall be they of his own household. Now, do you think Jesus was exempt from that? No. I think his, his foes were of his own household as well. And I think he had the, I think he, he had the, the most I think he had the most trouble with, with James uh, the oldest. And that James of Alphaeus, why you just totally ignore him? His name is James, they, and there's, no more, there's only one James left. Peter says, go tell James. James is dead in Acts 15. James stands up. Why can't that be James of Alphaeus? Now, it was also noted that Peter... James and John ministers to the twelve tribes. What is the first thing he says in the book of James? First he says, James, a servant of God, James, a servant of God. That's the first thing he says about himself. I'm a servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ. Two, now who's he addressing this to? The twelve tribes which are scattered abroad, greet. So he's writing the letter as as it like it says. He's Peter, James, and John were ministers to Israel, and that's who he's addressing this to. Look at look of uh, look at the back to this James the less thing again. James one and verse nine. Let the brother of low degree rejoice in that he is re exalted. In other words, just like Jesus says, he that hears these sayings and does them and teaches others is great in the kingdom of heaven. So he's teaching us, let the brother of low degree rejoice in that he is exalted. So he is teaching us and he's great in the kingdom of heaven because he also does it. He's James the less. He is servant. He is humble. And he knows, he fully, firmly believes he's going to be exalted. And he's rejoicing in that. Let's go back to uh, John 21. Uh, right after almost the end of the, of the book, and right after Jesus uh, asks Peter three times if he loves him, and he gives him this, uh, this task of, feeding the sheep, uh, Peter turns around and he sees the Lord and he sees this disciple whom he loves and he says, 21, Peter seeing him says to Jesus, Lord, and what shall this man do? 22, Jesus says to him, if I will that he tarry till I come, what is that to thee? Follow thou me. Okay? So Jesus didn't really put a heavy uh, burden on, on the disciple whom he loved. And that's probably because, again, he knew he was going to be martyred and he, and he had also had to take care of his mother. And, and, it was, and it had nothing to do with what he was asking Peter to do. It had nothing to do with him. In 23, then went out this saying abroad among the brethren that the, that disciple should not die. So everybody's thinking that he's going to tarry till he comes, and he's never going to die. 
And he, John is correcting that now, almost as if the disciple whom he loved already did die. He's correcting it. I mean, he's, he's correcting it as if he knows for sure that that disciple whom he loved died. Yet Jesus said, not unto him, he shall not die. But if I will that he tarry till I come, what is that to thee? Okay? This is that disciple which testifies, again the word martyr, of these things and wrote these things. And we know that his testimony is true. Okay? What is he talking about himself there? We know that my testimony is true. Would he say it that way? I don't think so. I mean, even if he wants to be, try to be humble about this thing and write in the third person like he is, like he might be, like I thought at once. And now he's going to explain the, about the fact that the book of James is a pretty small book. I think he's talking, in verse 21, I think he addresses that too. Because he says, and there are also many other things which Jesus did, the which, if they should, if they should be written, every one, I suppose that even the world itself could not contain the books that should be written. Amen. So he's addressing the fact that he writes a small letter. But he writes a very, very, very important letter, and it's very, very uh, teachable and addresses the, the, the main, some of the main things Christians go through. And he, again, the love that this servant of God has is that you be saved. The love, of, the love of our Savior is that you be saved, is that we be saved, that we listen to what he's talking about. Okay? So, that's just another point there.